Yeah, thank you to all of you, all the people online too. Um, so today we're going to talk about natural law and one of the subject areas we teach in social sciences. We have courses on Catholic social thought and ethics, which are sort of basic courses. And then we try to connect these with four other areas. So one of them is business ethics, economics, and social communications. But we also have other areas, just so you know about it, because I'm going to come back to this at the end. Um, history and politics, law and international relations, and uh, sociology, anthropology, and psychology. So all the time we're trying to connect the Christian tradition with these modern social sciences that help us understand the modern problems that we are facing today. So today we're going to look at natural law and business ethics. Is there a blossoming relationship? So I'd like to split this into three parts, what I call before the relationship, um, which means what was happening in this field before 2009. And basically what we'll see is there's a kind of historical development, which I'll say something about, which leads us to an, a point which is really separated from anything to do with natural law. But we also have some thinkers who are developing natural law thinking at the same time, but they are totally marginal. They are ignored by the mainstream. Then we get to the starting of the relationship. The starting of the relationship is kind of a shotgun marriage, which takes place as a result of this huge change, which occurs in the economic world as a result of financial crisis, which shakes to the absolute foundations, the whole economic establishment. Um, so people start looking around for other ideas. So the relationship starts to be built at that point. So then at the end, we'll look at, could this become blossoming, this relationship? So that's, that's the way we're going to work it. Um, so I thought we should look at this historically um, before the financial crisis. And I think a good question to ask is how old is business ethics as a subject? It's not very easy to answer this question. And I think we need to have at least three steps in answering it. Um, the first step would be to say, and those of you who are philosophers and have studied um, you know, uh, theology too, and you've studied philosophy, you will know about this, that there's ancient reflection about economic questions. Um, we all know something about Aristotle's idea of the distinction between oikonomia and krematistike. Oikonomia is the good kind of economics. It's the economics that is about uh, promoting the life of the household. Uh, so it's an economics that's inserted into a way of life. The way of life gives direction to the economic activity, gives meaning to it and purpose. Um, but then we have this unleashed form. This is the crematistica. This is the economic uh, activity, which is just self-referential, which is just about making as much money as possible. And of course, Aristotle sees this as very dangerous, as very um, uh, destabilizing for life and for society. Now, when we get to St. Thomas, we see a little bit of development on this. Um, he's not so universally negative about the criminalist decay because he's in a different historical circumstance. We've got the beginning of the modern commercial environment. Um, he is in the central country, which is Italy, of course, at that time. That, so they're, they're, he's at the, the forefront of innovation at that time. Um, and he recognizes that some of the work that merchants and other people are doing isn't bad. You know, he's sort of more or less says it's neutral. But he, 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 he starts to make some distinctions within this criminalistic part of the, of the ancient reflection. And then this connects with the other big issue pre-modern issue, which is usury. Uh, we know that, that this is discussed in many ancient cultures. We know it's in the Old Testament, of course. Um, and we usually have sort of two considerations regarding usury. One is that usually people are asking for um, loans in, in these ancient period because they're in dire need. So to make money out of somebody who's in dire need by asking for interest for it is seen as a very reprehensible thing to do. Um, but there's also another argument about this, which we see in Aristotle and some other thinkers, which is that money is something sterile, dead. It's not a, a living thing like land or like seeds or like animals. And so we can't expect 
anything to be produced from money. It's just a form of exchange. It's a dead thing. To, to want to get something out of it is to want something unnatural, something which shouldn't be looked for. Um, now, as uh, St. Thomas is changing a little bit the idea about crematistic, which will also continue to change with later Thomistic thinkers, um, also the consideration about usury is becoming less um, negative. Why? Not because we're becoming worse morally, but because the role of money in society starts to change. Instead of money just being a mere uh, form of exchange and something dead and useless, it starts to become a source of production. And, and this is when we start to get the idea of capital, you know, and we start to get the idea of investment. You know, you don't have the idea of investment in, in um, ancient cultures. So uh, money can start to produce something. It can start to become more like the land and the animals and the plants. And it's not just something dead. Therefore, it starts to become more realistic to accept that it could provide a return to people who invest this, who take part in, in the risk that's involved in that. So we still have the problem of poor people needing money and therefore having sometimes to pay back loans with interest which they can't afford so it's not that the usury problem disappears but it becomes much much less um, obvious it, the more dominant use of money becomes through capital and capital is productive so we can see these changes in thinking about the ethical side of economics in this sense as the actual economy is changing so that's, I think, the first background point. The second one then is where we actually get economics developing as a separate body of thought. You know, we just said Aristotle's thinking about economic questions, but he doesn't think of himself as an economist. You know, we, we're used until the mid 1700s that philosophers are thinking about economic questions. But around the mid 1700s, we start to get the separation out of economic thinking from philosophical thinking. Um, it starts to become a subject in its own right. And unfortunately for the British who always want to say they're the ones who started the economic um, discipline, it doesn't start in Britain. It starts in this country, which is what you'd expect because Italy is much longer a commercial tradition. It was the center of Western economy, maybe even bigger than that, for, for much, much longer. Um, so it's not a surprise that the first separate um, treatise on economics, it's produced in 1756 by a priest who has the chair of economics, the first chair in the world economics at uh, Federico Segondo, the, the university in Naples. Um, and uh, he produces this text, which many people would say is actually quite connected in many ways with Adam Smith's text, which comes out 20 years later. So these two are both philosophers beginning to write about economics as a separate subject. So I think we need to think about two basic um, contextual factors that influence what happens subsequently at the time of the birth, if you like, of economics as a separate discipline. First of all, we're in the midst of the Enlightenment. We're seeing the beginnings of liberalism developing. So it's not a surprise that this idea that human freedom, meaning freedom from, no constraints on me, um, is, is very influential in the subsequent development of economics, as well as the relationships being contractual, no more than contractual. You know, that's also starting to become a normal idea in the thought, philosophical thought at the time about any kind of public um, activity. So the Enlightenment is very, very influential on the philosophical background of e economics. But then perhaps even more importantly, we need to take into account that everybody thought Newton was a kind of a god at that time. And the economists really want to be like the physicists. Um, and so there's a, a, an American economist, um, um, Heilbronner, Robert Heilbronner, who jokes about how Freud would say uh, that women have a penis envy, they really would rather be men. And similarly, economists have a kind of physics envy, they really would rather be physicists. And hence, they, they absolutely adopt uh, this mathematical language 
um, and they abandon all, any kind of philosophical reflection. Economics becomes, as much as they can make it, a mathematical subject. The language of economics becomes mathematics. Um, and they think that really distinguishes them when the later social sciences develop from all those sorts of fluffy things like sociology and, you know, and political science that just blah, 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 you know, not serious thinking like they have because they're using mathematics. Um, so, so these are very, very influential in the way economics develops. So when we actually get to the point of business ethics as a discipline in its own right, people start teaching courses in business ethics, we have all this background. You see the first courses in the US in the 1970s in the business schools. Um, so given this background, I think it's not a surprise that um, if I give you a text which really isn't extreme, it's quite representative of the kind of texts that you would get in business ethics, uh, manuals, teaching resources and things like this, um, that it's this kind of text. I should say something about the author first. Elaine Sternberg uh, was a, a big financial guru and, and she was very important in financial operations. Um, she, at a certain point, decided to give all that up and reinvent herself as a business ethicist. Um, so, of course, she was seen as very serious by um, all kinds of journals. For instance, The Economist adopted her as a kind of house ethicist and they were always referring to her. So you probably know the economist is kind of Bible for the big uh, businesses and many thinkers in, in the economic sphere. So she writes this book with the title Just Business, which is of course a, a play in English between justice, just as justice, and just meaning only business, not all these other extraneous things all around. And in this book, she, um, wants to say she's an Aristotelian. That's another reason why I thought I'd use this book. Um, she wants to argue that she's an Aristotelian. The main reason why she says this is because she thinks business has ends, business has goals. Okay, and we should talk about these. Um, now, she is used by The Economist in, in a couple of very, very influential surveys that they do in the early 2000s, so before the financial crisis, on this thing called corporate social responsibility. Um, I mentioned that because she talks about social responsibility in this quote, um, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. So the quote itself, as you can see, just as prostitution occurs when sex is proffered for money rather than love, so it exists when business pursues love or social responsibility rather than money. So we've got a perversion of the ends of business. You see. Business managers who eschew maximizing long-term owner value and direct their firms to any other goal are as much prostitutes as artists or sportsmen who sell out for financial gain. And then we get the last line to reinforce her Aristotelian credentials, supposedly. In each case, the activity is perverted and the right true end, using inverted commas as she does, the right true end is neglected in favor of some other extraneous objective. So I think you can see if this is really representative and, I, and I, you just have to take my word for it, I think it is pretty representative of the kind of thing that you got before 2009, there wasn't much we could do with this. You know, in, in this university, we launched a master's program in um, con, um, collaboration with the LUMSA 2004, and I had to do the module on ethics. And I always had to have first few lessons explaining to the students how I couldn't use any of the mainstream business ethics texts or anything like this with them. We had to just put all this stuff on one side and then start from some marginal thinkers like this one here that we, we will say something about in a minute. Um, so a few Dominicans, um, some things by Professor Zaman, you know, you have to try and reconstruct starting from something a bit more serious of, of an ethical nature. So I just want to have a few words now about these people on the margins who include quite a lot of Dominican thinkers in the 20th century. And because Arthur Frieden Utz produces the most, I would say, elaborate thinking about natural law and economics, I use him here, but I could have talked about Louis-Joseph Lebray, I could talk about some other Dominicans who are living still, um, 
you know, we have a lot in these two books. I'll say something about that at the end. Um, now, this um, text that you have here, this slide, is a basic kind of synthesis which I've done. Oh, I'm changing the slides, sorry. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Um, so, um, yes, it's a synthesis based on um, from various parts of the fourth volume of his five volume social ethics, which he wrote right at the end of his life. He dies 2001. Um, so this is sort of crowning of his thought. Um, there's other volumes about other parts of social ethics. Volume four is economic ethics. Um, so those of you who have been following this conference and know something about natural law, I think will um, see very clearly that we have something looking like a natural law analysis in this structure, level one, level two, level three. Um, I should say also that he uses this term economic order a lot. It's a very Germanic term. You don't hear of it much outside the <laughs> Germanic um, literature, but it's actually quite useful, especially when we're thinking about putting natural law together with economics. So we've got this level one, which is what we, we were talking about yesterday often, this, these first principles, these first precepts, the, the most general, the most abstract, the supreme norms, or we could also say the ideals to which we want to aim, um, or we could say the level that we would be at before the fall, if you like, human beings as they could have been without sin, or they could be at the end, sort of eschatological kind of idea, which remains a kind of ideal level that we should keep trying to move towards, okay? So he puts two basic things on this level. The first statement is the common good is prior to the private good, okay? Um, and then I quote from him, attention to the environment is of the highest order among ethical requirements. So this is decades ago, he's saying this, uh, the environment as a kind of a common good, it should be put ahead of private goods at this first level. Okay. Um, the other point is that everybody should have a chance to participate in the economy. That's also a level one requirement um, and should have uh, so access to work or in some way participating in the economy. Also access to cultural and spiritual goods are fundamental. They're not added extras, just like basic goods for our physical welfare, you know, food and, um, and clothing and all that kind of thing. Um, now, I think this level actually fits very well with what we were talking about yesterday, insofar as we were saying, you know, these are things which people should be able to know without any sort of big theoretical development. Just an ordinary person in the street shouldn't be able to get the first ideas, the first uh, principles and precepts of natural law. Because I think if you went out on the streets and asked, you know, a beggar or a tourist or a shop owner or anybody else out there, and you asked enough of them, especially so you start to get a sort of statistically significant result, um, what would be the economy you would really like to live in? You know, what, if we could get rid of all the problems we have in the economy now, what would be really the, 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 the economy that you would think would be really good, the one we should try to develop? Well, I'm sure they'd say all sorts of things, but I reckon the two most common things they would say is we need a sustainable economy, not one that's not going to destroy our environment. So that's common good is prior to private good. And, and they would say, and we want everybody be, to be able to be part of it. No one left behind. Everyone, you know, we don't like it that people are excluded, that there's people on the streets. You know, people don't like it. We'd much prefer if everybody could be involved. So you know, I think this is really actually fitting very well with this basic natural law thinking. Then we get to level two. Level two is the concrete situation, the kind of beings we actually are. We're not fully developed, we're on the way, we're changeable, we're sinful. It's where we are now, it's where history really counts, it's where different countries can have different trajectories, all this kind of thing. Um, now on this level, he would say the main consideration is we need private property. And, and the fact that the Jerusalem community 
uh, in the Acts of the Apostles gets into trouble would be because they actually mix up these two levels. They, they perhaps thinking the end is coming now, we should have the eschatological level. So level one applies to us now. They put all their goods together and then they sort of forget about it. And they, they start having economic problems. And of course, St. Paul has to have this you know, whip around, get this collection to help them, you know? So um, we, we do need systems of private property in order, as St. Thomas gives three reasons, you probably know this very well, so I'm going to go into it. Um, uh, lots of other people have. We need private property in order to produce goods. Um, but that private property is for the sake of, of sharing. So the private property is a kind of means to an end. It's not an absolute. Um, or we could say private property is for the universal destination of goods, which is the term that you hear in Catholic social teaching. So for instance, paying taxes is absolutely normal. You'd expect to have to pay taxes on, on your private goods because that's about supporting the universal destination of goods and somehow having universal use, even though we need some kind of private property. So then uh, to finish this thing of Utz, he would say, then we have level three, which are all kinds of practical problems that businesses have to deal with. And you see in his book, he talks about them, things like just wages, like just prices, um, can we have strikes, you know, all kinds of things like this. Um, and he would say, but we can't deal with those issues at that level if we haven't got the other two levels put right. So in other words, you can't ask businesses to be ethical on their own without this framework, basically. They need to be working in this way. So, okay, we've talked so far about what was the mainstream and who were the marginal thinkers. Um, now we come to the starting of the relationship, this absolutely cataclysmic event, the financial crisis. Well, we could say a lot of things about it. Basically, we get a, a huge breakdown of mainstream consensus. Well, you're gonna have to keep doing that. Um, thank you. Um, so there's lots of things we could say, just two very quick things. There was a, a business, uh, a professor of business in London Business School called Sumantra Goshal, who wrote an article which was published in 2005, so it's published before the financial crisis, with the title, Bad Management Theories Are Destroying Good Management Practices. And it was all about what was being taught in business schools at the time. Now, he was a professor of business. Nobody took much notice of it. After the financial crisis starts being cited all over the place, this article along with others that were saying something similar. Now, the other interesting thing about that article is that Goshel was dying when he wrote it. And it was finished by his son and one of his colleagues. So it's a kind of a creed occur from this guy who knew what was going on, could see what was happening, could see we were on a really destructive path and was trying to say something before he died you know, about it. Um, so this article is, is really studied after 2001. Another thing that really starts happening is people start talking about purpose. You know, you can't open a journal now about business or management without there being something about purpose in it. And I'm not talking about the purpose that Elaine Sternberg was talking about before. This is a purpose which says things like, we should be promoting human development, or we should be protecting the environment, you know, or, or uh, we should be good corporate citizens, or all kinds of things like this. Um, so the really crucial thing about this is that we're seeing goals coming back into the discussion. This is teleology coming back into the discussion. Whereas before we had this idea, everybody had their own private goals and in the economy, we just produce the resources so that then everybody could achieve their private goals and we don't discuss anything about goals. Hence why Sternberg could say, the only goal of business is maximizing value for the owners. Um, now we start to say, we have to start sharing some goals. And this is very significant if we're going to start talking about natural law and business ethics. I just mentioned that it's also supported by other developments. The UN in 1999 agreed these millennium development goals, which were for poor countries. The idea was that the UN governments, NGOs, charities, everybody would coordinate around achieving these goals. They were absolutely public social goals. And then these are followed up in 2015 with the successor goals, which are called sustainable development goals, 
uh, which also UN agreed for all nations. And there's a whole procedure you have to go through. Every country has to monitor every year how it's doing with regard to these goals. So we have ever more um, this, uh, the idea that we should have shared goals, not just private goals, public goals. And, and um, uh, I was going to say about that. Um, I forgot. Anyway, um, so we we um, lost my, my my line. Anyway, okay. So what happens then as a, in in the literature on business ethics? Well, um, this is a table. This is a table that comes from an editorial in two thousand and fifteen in one of the big business ethics journals called Business Ethics Quarterly. Um, it's celebrating 25 years of the journal. Um, and what they did was look at what were the subjects that were looked at over the years by the different um, contribute, contributors to the journal. Well, there's a lot of things we could say about this, but the one thing I want to look at is the little gray line, the last line, which you may not be able to see, but it's virtue ethics is the last line. and. Um, this starts off very low at the beginning. It goes up a bit to 2005, then it goes right down again to 2010. But then from 2010, it goes very sharp increase. Articles on the virtue ethics. Other subject areas are going down at that time, apart from CSR, corporate social responsibility, it's not a topic that we're talking about. But the one that's going up the sharpest is virtue ethics. Now, virtue ethics can mean a lot of different things. Um, it um, doesn't only mean virtue ethics connected with natural law. For instance, there's another article that's looking at all the, the um, contributions over about a 30 year period to business ethics journals and argues that about 25% of them are based on McIntyrean virtue ethics, which is not a natural law based virtue ethics. So we can have different types of virtue ethics. So increase in virtue ethics doesn't necessarily mean automatically an, a closer discussion of natural law. But we do get some interesting articles and I give you these two examples. First one is called Thomas Aquinas on Justice as a Global Virtue in Business. It's published in 2012 in Business Ethics Quarterly. One of the authors, Klaus Dirksmeier, um, is the successor to Hans Kuhn at the head of the Welt Ethos Institute, the Global Ethics Institute founded by Kuhn. Um, you can see in that article, I put it in brackets, natural law is mentioned 34 times in that article. It's actually 40 times in the article, but six of them are in the titles of journals in the bibliography at the end. So it's mentioned 34 times in the text. And you could see it's to do with the fact that he wants a global ethic. He wants to look for um, resources that will help business develop a global ethic. And he thinks because Thomas is talking about the natural light of reason, we can get there. And they say things like, Thomas manages the tension between cultural diversity and moral uniformity. It's exactly what they're thinking you need for a global ethic, okay? We could say more about it, but I think that's sufficient for now. The other one is called Personalist Business Ethics and Humanistic Management. This is written by a woman, same year, Acevedo, I think she's Spanish, Journal of Business Ethics, another of the leading journals. Um, she mentions natural law even more, 43 times. Um, and what she's trying to say is, we can think about this big field that's called humanistic management, either in a non-personalist, and so she would say things like Hume's idea of a subjective view of the person that could be behind this non-personalistic view or a personalistic view. And she wants to say personalist, humanistic, big, big mouthful, management uh, is much more serious proposal than some of the others. And she tries to argue this using Jacques Maritain as the foundation for it. And obviously with uh, natural law behind because she's talking about it 43 times in the text. Um, so then she tries to apply this to a number of areas like uh, marketing and product development and education, things like this. So you can see you've got two articles here, one looking at the way businesses manage themselves, that's the Acevedo one, and the one looking at the global ethic for business, both of them using natural law. 
Now you might say, well, okay, these big journals did publish them, but did they really become mainstream, these articles? And that's where you need to look at the citations. So the first one gets cited nine times in other journals in the EBSCO Business Source Premier, which is one of the main uh, databases for business um, publications. The other one, five times. Now you should know that uh, most business ethic articles on average get cited between five to 10 times. That's a kind of standard level of citation. You do get articles which are cited more, but they are kind of outliers. So the normal is, is, these are in the normal range, okay? So what you can see from this is these articles are being talked about in a normal kind of way like others. Um, okay, uh, this, this is, I'm just showing you this slide here with these um, uh, connectedpapers.com, sorry, thank you. Um, this is a very interesting website where you can put the name of your paper in and it will give you this interesting um, kind of graphic trying to show you what are the papers that have similar arguments to the one that you're interested in. It's not based on citations, this website. It's based on similar arguments being used in the papers using AI technology to do it. Um, so you can see here, I put the DxMile one in, you can see there's various other groups of articles around which are connected with the DxMile. You could start looking at that. If you put another business ethics article in this website, you'd get a very similar looking so this is another way of showing that it's getting into the mainstream. So to conclude, are we looking at a blossoming relationship? We're definitely looking at a relationship now. Um, virtue ethics has arrived and so has corporate purpose. Teleology has arrived in business ethics. It's not yet clear whether it will become a natural law-based virtue ethics. But I think the signs are good because of the environmental crisis. It's the problem we're facing, which is pushing this issue. That's the one thing I wanted to say before when I lost my line. Um, we, it's not the thinkers who are pushing this. It's the people who are facing real problems who are saying, we have to talk about the goals we are um, thinking about. And they're pushing the thinkers to try and incorporate this stuff into their thinking. The last thing I would say, though, that, and this is where I'd be interested to hear things from theologians and philosophers, is that in these articles, the natural order has its own end. There is no role for grace. Um, I suppose it's kind of obvious, in a way, that that would be the case. Um, but it does, it is a bit of a limit from the point of view of a Thomistic um, idea about natural law. You know, if we think about John Milbeck's very interesting lecture, which he gave about a month ago here, in the uh, John Paul II lecture series. Um, he talked about right integralists, he called them, uh, uh, thinkers on natural law. And, and these would be the ones who think that there's a goal of nature itself, independently of grace or anything supernatural. Um, whereas he calls the left integralist, he's not saying in terms of right and left political. But the left integralist, he thinks, are the ones who think that there is a natural openness to grace and, and we can't achieve our natural ends without the help of grace. Um, so I would say these articles, they are more right integralist, according to Milbank's um, position, which might be a bit of a problem from our point of view. So just to finish, you can see here, I tried to say this point at the end because I think we really need the support in social sciences of the other faculties. And I wanted to use this chance um, to say in this interfaculty conference, interdisciplinary conference, that you know, the more we can do together, the more we on the front lines, if you like, in, in social sciences can have the big guns behind us, the philosophers and the theologians coming up with stuff to help us do this work, the better, because I think there's going to be more and more chance for this. You can see the problems are pushing us in this way. If we can put more out there, we can do more for the mission of the church, but we can also help society more. And we've got about a thousand pages in these two books of, of stuff about what Dominicans have been doing. So, you know, it could be done in terms of theology and philosophy, I hope, as well. Thank you very much. Excuse me. If that was Thank you so much, Ellen. You have been our vice rector and you are now our uh, team. And you deal with the uh, sad science. <laughs> That's the way they call it economy. Yes. Um,
The title was uh, with the question mark, blossoming or not blossoming. I raise one question to you, which is related to the blossoming uh, times. Um, as a matter of fact, the development of more relationships between uh, ethics and economy is coinciding with uh, a period in human history where the accumulation of wealth in a few hands uh, seems to be the rules. Every year we receive a report on the spreading of economy. It, it seems that there is a kind of, uh, how do you say, calamit, you say also, calamita in English? A magnet. Okay, a magnet uh, where, where the more wealth is going year uh, by year. So uh, my question to you is the following. The father of uh, our economy, uh, coincidentally, his name was Adam, eh? Adam Smith, um, based all his theory on private interest from the very first pages of, of his famous book on the War Foundations. Instead, here we base everything on the common interest. I read common, it's written common good, and I read common interest anyway. There is any contradiction between, because the church, as a matter of fact, never was against uh, the classical economy. He try, it tries get the church to reform or to give instructions or to give ethics and so on and so forth. But apparently, the private interest and common interests are conflicted. Am I wrong? <laughs> I think the thing to say, Luigi, is that they have to be connected in the right way. That's, that's the point. If we go only towards common good, we end up in a situation where people are not encouraged to work, they don't take care of things, we, we have the problems of communism, this kind of thing. If we go only to private, we tend to end up in the kind of situation we're dealing with now, where people are only thinking about their private goods and we are destroying a lot of common important goods and I'm not only talking about environment I'm talking about things like trust like uh, social bonds between people we have all kinds of problems on that level in Britain now we have a minister for loneliness or at least we did I don't know if we still do but anyway so um, who was set up after that report was done by Joe Cox who was who was murdered during the Brexit vote oh. um, so uh, there's that the, the, we have to have the right relationship between these two things. And you could say it comes back to who we are as human beings. Yes, we are individuated. We have a body, we have certain needs which we need to satisfy, but we find our true good in relation with others. Uh, we All the happiness research shows that, for instance. People can be fairly poor, but if they have good relationships, they have high levels of happiness, which means when you put countries ranked by how happy they are it's not the richest countries that come out on top because they often have other problems that they are dealing with which reduce happiness and are deep are touching the relationships which are not strong enough and that's connecting us with the common good so we need to have the right relationship between the two of them Good. So the good news is that we may continue to read from Adam Smith with some footnotes that we derive from that. Okay, any other question, please? Please. I suppose the question here about what, what we find in this post-2009 and this new engagement. Um, what I'm wondering about, I'm thinking just more observationally, uh, when, we, when one thinks now about socially minded or common minded local business, I'm never quite sure it's not merely the reappearance of Carnegie's gospel of wealth, right? Insofar as the proposal seems to be let business be super prosperous, but then it's justified just if some of those profits go to public benefaction, right? Um, and I'm wondering is there much said or has there been much thought? outside Marxist circles on the way the actual practice of doing the economy by the people working, by the people in as marketing, whatever, that the, the activity in which they do the making of the money is itself humanizing. 
Yes, it's a very good question. And if we don't manage to do this, we won't make this breakthrough. So I think this is part of the question mark, but there is some thinking going on about it. I mean, one of the things is that people reacted in the economic sphere in a very, uh, they were very interested by Caritas in Veritate, for instance, which talked a lot about this, about how we needed to bring the, the, the benefits of non-profit management, and we might see also the church related, into the economic sphere. We, we don't have these separate spheres where you have rights organized by governments, um, private interest and self-interest organized in the economy, and then sort of giving and caring in the nonprofit sector. But these things have to come together. So people are trying to work out how to do it. I think that I think there's interest in doing it, maybe a bit less in the United States. I think you know that it's partly for historical reasons, you know. Um, but I think in general there is there is interest in it. We we need to push it a bit. This is where I'm I'm also keen that we sort of find ways of working on it together because I think we can make some contribution on this point. Okay. Any other question? This, uh... You may introduce yourself when, when we speak because it gives an idea of the field where we come from. But from the top standpoint, um, and particularly interested in questions related to faith and science. And so, this isn't a faith and science question, but I'd like to give them a go in the sense that there are ways in which, you know, thinking about, say, Thomistic natural philosophy and sort of things through Aristotle, there are ways in which that does engage with contemporary philosophy of science. And, and, but, it, but it's sort of, there's, 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 there's communication, but it's sort of, in a small uh, sort of sense, because the people we're talking to, these people we're most likely engaged with are not, you know, it's not the majority of scientists, the majority of physicists. Uh, and so I'm curious, you, you, you've shown the way in which there is sort of engagement with Thomistic philosophy and virtue ethics with the business ethics. How integrated is that community with the people actually running businesses and, and more broadly? Does, does, does that community feel like they're having a good impact on, you know, people at you know, major corporations, major tech companies, things like that, or do they feel independent of how they engage with virtue ethics? They feel so marginalized for most of the Thank you. Very interesting question. I, I would say it's actually the people who are, who are the business leaders who are pushing this change. Uh, because they can see they have to make a change and they want people thinking about it and helping them. Um, so the, the crucial thing is, I think, you know, uh, having a crisis is, is quite a useful thing. The trouble is, of course, it, it's a terrible thing as well. A lot of people lost their jobs. The, the fallout was awful. So nobody wants to say there should be another crisis. But if there is a crisis which affects science in some way, that will be an opportunity. Um, uh, so I think that uh, right now, you, what you're talking about in the scientific sphere is a bit like where we were before the financial crisis. So now we have the business thinkers and the business ethicists having to take this seriously because the business people are saying, what you told us before was wrong. You know, we have to think differently about this, you know, give us better ideas. So for instance, myself, before 2009, I was nobody in this sphere. After 2009, I get invited to talk to CEOs of the top 100 companies, FTSE 100 is called, in UK. You know, I mean, I just said the same things. I said, I didn't change what I was saying, but they changed what they wanted. You know, that's, that's the change. In theory, our time is over. By the way, uh, two more. Uh, questions, uh, please be short and introduce yourself once again to, to the left hand side, please. was that what seemed like a good like environment was also like 
Thank you very much. Also, a really interesting question. I would say we are always going to have a mixed up world. You know, we're dealing with the real world where there's the wheat and the tans growing up together. So we're never going to have a change which goes from bad to good in a complete sense. So I think what we're looking at is do we have tendencies which are moving more in an interesting direction that we can work with and help to guide? So I think after the financial crisis, we did see that. But I absolutely agree with what you're saying, that some of the environmental stuff is just weird and it's wacky. And I think perhaps less now than it was. I think it's becoming a bit more serious now, partly because businesses are getting more involved in it. And it's being a, a bit more involved in some realistic business, business planning and things like that. Whereas before it was a little bit more connected with this kind of marginal movements and, and things like this. But you know, I'm not in any way saying it's disappeared. I think it's a very interesting point about the COVID. We will see more effect, I think, um, on business thinking as a result of COVID. I think it's a little bit soon. You saw that the 2009 was the crisis. We see the first really interesting articles bringing in natural law about three years later. I think we will start seeing that coming in. But we haven't quite got there yet. But I think you're absolutely right that it's um, the COVID fo focused us even more directly on a really fundamental good of human health. And, and that will also have an effect in the way people are thinking. I mean, one of the things that I think will be interesting is with all this discussion about envi environment and, and that we have to treat the environment the way it is, not just the way we want to treat it. It's not a huge step to start saying, well, then human beings also have a nature because we are part of the environment and the created order. And, and, and therefore we should start treating ourselves according to, you know, coming back to the bioethics issues that we were looking at before. So, um, you know, I think there's, there's all sorts of interesting developments that could occur. Thank you for that question. I don't know exactly. I think we're a bit early to see the effect of COVID, unfortunately. So last but not least, apparently. Remember to introduce yourself, thank you. students here, come from the corporate world, I can say. And even though we're talking about natural law, there also is a reality of corporate law, which is a separate legal entity to the individuals that set up, set up the enterprise. And all we need to do is to profit. So it is against the principles of corporate law to do something that doesn't generate profit. So the reality is that to, to remain within the legal boundaries of the definition, it is simply because by having the ethical standards that the profit is increased. So therefore, is it the populations that are driving? Business ethics as opposed to the other way around, or is there now a dialogue about the two and two and both the both rising up? Yeah, it's always very difficult to know where something starts in these very complicated systems. The first thing I would say about corporate law is you really have to look at what the laws are because different countries have different laws. Um, in the United States, for instance, I think it's pretty clear that the basic standard kind of law is, is focusing companies on producing financial wealth only. Hence why the, the 
they've now produced this thing called the B, the B Corporation, the Benefit Corporation. So if you want to do something different, you can just re-qualify um, well, yourself as a B Corporation. Of course, you have to go through all the proper uh, procedures and everything. So there's new developments in law to try to deal with this. There are other countries like, say, UK, where people are really convinced now, I think, that what was happening was a certain interpretation of the law. And the law didn't actually require you just to produce profit. So, you know, you have to look at specific cases to know what's going on in, in different places. But I absolutely agree with you that law is a very crucial part of this. Who is pushing this? I think there's various things. You have to look perhaps in very much at sectors and specific issues. In some sectors, it's really being pushed by the, by the customers, by uh, the maybe more the sorts of... Um, um, uh, I forget now the, the word they use for it, but the sorts of things you buy in supermarkets, I forgot now the name of it. Um, customers often push on things like that. And you've got an important economist here in Italy, Leonardo Becchetti, talking about how you could use your, your wallet as a, as a form of pressure on, on uh, companies. Other sectors, I think it's more coming from the businesses. It depends. Um, uh, it's... Uh, it, there's various kinds of factors. I think there's generally a kind of a zeitgeist which has changed. And the particular way in which it's working depends a bit on particular countries, particular sectors and that. But I think all these figures are important. And I think you're absolutely right. The corporate law is a very, very important factor in this, which I didn't talk about at all. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, everyone, for attending this session. And now the some remarks to close our conference. So a few uh, concluding remarks at the end. So I believe that um, as followers of the Aristotelian Thomistic tradition, we firmly believe in the actuality of the concept of natural law. And moreover, we have actually heard on the first day that uh, St. Thomas Aquinas uh, thinks or do not, uh, does not equate uh, natural law, law with eternal law, but rather thinks that natural law is a particular participation in eternal law. And I believe that throughout this conference, we saw various flavors of this participation through natural law in eternal law. Come rappresentanti eh, della questa tradizione eh, classica di Aristote, Aristote, uh, Aristote, Aristotele, Aristotele? Aristotelico Tomistica, grazie. Eh, vogliamo essere sia consapevoli della complessità eh, del discorso su questo concetto eh, di diritto naturale sia anche pronti non solo a difenderlo ma anche ad apprezzare e promuovere il contribuito di eh, questo concetto eh, della legge naturale eh, nelle controversie sfidanti e vessanti della nostra cultura eh, contemporanea. E I think that we saw how difficult it is, but uh, I think and I'm convinced that we uh, have to and should believe that it is still valid, possible, and we are the ones who should uh, who should do it. So I hope that this conference uh, was both a contribution uh, to the conversation and also an inspiration for the future. Uh, and I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, at the very end uh, to all of those who uh, were engaged in uh, preparation of this event. So on the behalf of the uh, university, uh, first, I would like to thank Sister Helen, because you started those conferences uh, several years ago. We had a break with Father Michal Paluk. We had a break uh, for about two years because of COVID, but now uh, we are back. So thank you for uh, both of you to, uh, for the idea and inspiration. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers, uh, the chairs uh, of all the sessions, and all who participated uh, and came to listen to those talks here in presence and uh, online. Uh, this year edition of the Communitas Conference was coordinated by the Thomistic Institute. Uh, so I would like to thank Sister Thomas Miriam, 
uh, she's back there. Uh, Juliana, who is probably outside, uh, and uh, Molly, uh, who is here, for all your help uh, in preparation of this event, for advertising it and uh, all the work that you've done. Thank you very much once again, uh, and hopefully you will see here next year uh, to discuss uh, another topic uh, which is important for the contemporary culture and us as philosophers, theologians uh, present in this culture. Thank you very much. God bless you. Have a good day.